Thanks for joining the Focus Hunting Podcast for us. Hunting in the outdoors isn't just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Join us as we cover all things hunting, fishing, and the outdoors in Western Canada. I can tattooed on my shoulder. I'm like, okay. Um, I'm good with that. Um, looks like we got somebody else trying to join us here, but... Um, mm-hmm. Uh, looks looks really old. I didn't <laughs> seniors day. <laughs> so, you know, I I cringe when guys tell me that. Oh, I I'm a, you know, I'm an Onyx guy. I I only use Onyx, or I'm a Go Hunt guy, and I only. Oh, I'm a only. I live and die Go Hunt. I'm like, well, I like it too, or I use Gaia, or I like you Canadian guys. I recommend if you don't know about Gaia, you need to look at it very carefully. It's got a tremendous amount of Canadian tools. We've talked about that before on the podcast, but uh, it is a very valuable tool um, it, here in the West and even for Canadians. I think is from what you know from what I've seen with it. It's one of my favorite apps. But the key is multiple tools, and that's why you know I said um, Google Earth. Google Earth is still to this day is my number one hunt planning tool. I spend the most time in this course going through Google Earth and how to use it effectively and efficiently and how to apply it because it is still the number one. Now, the apps are getting better and better and better, guys. They're getting better all the time. More tools, more features, more things. But nobody has the image quality of Google Earth. Nobody has the historical imagery capabilities of Google Earth. Nobody has the root profile capabilities of Google Earth. Nobody has the view shed capabilities of Google Earth. They just don't. Now, maybe they will, and they don't have the 3D capabilities of Google Earth. Now, they have 3D, and it's pretty good, but it's not as good as Google Earth. So I know I sound like a broken record, but but Google Earth, guys, is no good to you in the field. If you're not doing your work now in February, mm-hmm. like we're talking about with this podcast, that tool is useless to you in September. This is a tool that has to be used and applied and vetted right now. Uh, not right now, but before the hunt, right? Mm-hmm. Before the hunt. So when I talk about um, zones of pressure, I spend an enormous amount of time looking at vehicle accesses, what roads are open, what roads are closed, and what roads are seasonal. And I do not rely on one tool. I look at my hunting apps. I look at my layers, my toolkits that I built in Google Earth. But then ultimately, I go retrieve the, you guys might want to write this down. I retrieve the geotagged PDF files from the National Forest Service where I got the most recent motor vehicle closures and I always lay them out side by side on my map and I trace the roads to make sure that I'm not missing anything. One of my very, very best hunting areas that I've ever been to was a road that was seasonally closed. It closed on September the 6th, which in Montana, you never hear of a road closing in the after the first week of elk season. It rarely happens, right? It's either they're open or they're not, right? They're not, they don't close in the middle of the season. But this one did for some reason. All the apps were wrong. Every app was wrong. Said the road was open, open, open. So I pulled up there. I found it. I pulled up there. There's an outfitter sitting there, young kid. He had some horses. I had my llamas. There was a big ruckus. Uh, and uh, we got to talk. And he goes, how'd you, how'd you find this spot? I said, well, to be honest with you, I was a little worried. I said, I uh, he said this road closed last week. And he goes, yeah, yeah, it does. I'm like, well, that's why I'm here. I gave it a week. I figured after that road closes a week later, the elk might filter back in here because the train looks incredible. He says, well, yeah, yeah, it is. And I say, he said, you're the first person I've ran into here before like this. I said, because everybody thinks this road's open. And I'm like, yeah. I said, how do they? And he says, they got a bolt and they have a big gate and everything. So you can't get around it. And uh, sure enough. So we talked and he asked me where I was going. And I, you know, we stayed away from each other, obviously. And I went in, there was hundreds of bulls bugling in this spot. Nice. And it was a spot that was the first weekend, I'm sure, got worn out with vehicle, with ATVs and everything else. Mm-hmm. But I stumbled on it, guys. I know that was a long-winded story, but I stumbled on it.
because I was going through that checklist of testing my motor vehicle accesses in this spot. I had totally discounted this spot, guys. This was like spot seven until I found the error. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to move that up my list. And I ended up going there and we ended up, and we were covered up in elk for a solid week. I mean, more elk. There, I hate to say this. There was almost too many elk because these bulls would bugle and they'd run towards another bugle. We couldn't, we couldn't call an elk. There was so many elk bugling. One, we couldn't, I'm, I'm 58 years old. My hearing is not what it used to be. I couldn't tell what direction these bastards were. Number one. And number two, they're bugling every direction and they're all going to each other and not coming to us. And it was, a we were basically trying to intercept bulls on the way to other bulls. And it was crazy. It was one of the craziest bugling fests I've ever been in. But the fun part about it was I found it with this technique. And um, so anyway, that was long winded, but I wanted to spend time on that because that is a very important module. It's long, it's detailed, and step-by-step, step, and it's not a waste of time. Trust me on this. Because the more you study the pressure, where it's coming from, and how it's navigating in your hunting area, the more the picture starts to make sense. The more you start to really wrap your mind around a hunt area. Uh, real quick, I'll tell you another quick story. I love telling stories with the thing um, that, that applies to what I'm doing here. So I was in a spot. We hiked in six miles, which isn't that far. We took the llamas in. We take the llamas in. We ran into some elk. It looks good. We set up our camp. Everything's money. We go out in the morning. We're into elk. Called in an elk. We didn't get one. Didn't get him. I was hiking down the trail, and I see this older dude. I'm like, in jeans he's wearing jeans blue jeans and it's rainy and he's got cowboy boots on slick bottom cowboy boots and, and jeans and he's got a long bow nothing wrong with that setup guys nothing wrong with that but i let's just put it this way he didn't just give me the impression that he was the epitome of fitness okay and i go up to him i'm like how did you get in here i didn't i didn't mean it disrespectfully he goes, well, I just hiked in this morning. I'm like, what do you mean you hiked in this morning? In your jeans? Well, my truck's just parked right over there. I'm like, what do you mean over there? <laughs> Dude, I missed a road. I I studied this area and studied this area. And this was an obscure road, right? This is a local dude that knew about this road. Mm -hmm. But it was, I did find it on the National Forest Motor Vehicle Use Map. But I didn't look at it. It was not on the hunt applications. It was not in there, but it was on there. And this 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 local knew about it. And this dude was like a quarter mile from where we were. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. You know, and he was the only, he didn't mess up for hunting at all. There's no problem. But my point is the time you spend on this is never a waste of time. Mm -hmm. It's never a waste of time. Um, So... Okay. It, it's actually funny that you say that because the more I paid attention to that, the more intense the pressure that actually helped my hunting. Cause I was able to narrow in. Cause when you see that and you see the trails and then in archery, if you're in there, if you go back in in late season, you know where all that pressure is coming from. And like, I took my kid out. I knew exactly where those elk were going to be because the pressure was so intense. I could narrow in. I'm like, Oh, they can only be in three different spots. Yeah, because the pressure from private and from public is so intensified. The trail access is only limited. Like, oh, they got to be right there. And we went there opening morning. We got them a bull. We found two hundred head. So it's just it's so critical. This part was one of the things that just makes your hunts more efficient, even too. Well, it's funny you said that because I get a lot of questions from Washington, Oregon guys that hunt areas high pressure areas right like mm -hmm. like what you're describing they're like mark i can't get away from hunters it's impossible <laughs> excuse me this zone's a pressure doesn't apply to me i said oh yeah mm -hmm. it's more important for you yeah and they're like well, what do you mean i said guys i know this is going to sound crazy but it's easier to and i'm not discounting you derek on you it's easier to find elk in higher pressure areas than it is in no pressure areas yeah 
And everybody's like, oh, what are you talking about? I said, let me give you an example. So if you go into the wilderness, you hike into the middle of the, let's just call it the Bob Marshall. There's no elk there anyway, so let's just use that example. You go into the Bob Marshall wilderness, millions of acres. You got to find the place where these elk want to be because there's no pressure. There's nobody there. There's no moving them around you have to find the exact place that they want to be because of the food sources the north slope all the Mm -hmm. features but if you take Derek's um example when you're looking at for places where people the furthest the most difficult the whatever you want to look at where people guaranteed you got a high chance of running into elk there those are easier to identify than some pinpoint spot in the middle of a million acre wilderness guy sometimes um so zones of pressure is absolutely money for guys that hunt high pressure areas now for low pressure areas it's not as important because the elk can be anywhere there's low pressure Mm -hmm. But it's still important. And it, and and in my case, what's more important in the lower pressure areas is the best access spot, which is going to be the easiest way to get in, easiest way to get out, which is going to be the, you know, the best for my llamas or the best for backpacking or the best for this, the best for that. So when you look at zones of pressure, guys, remember, we're not only, the last thing I'll leave you with on this is we're not only looking at motor vehicle use. Derek, Derek said something in his statement I want to point out. The trail pressure is critical in high-pressure areas. So where the established, what I mean is the established trails, you know, meaning on the topo map, where the trails are. In a high-pressure area, you want to avoid, you want to work around those as much or more than you're going to work around the roads. Because hunters, they're just creatures of happy guys, most, I should say all. 90% of guys are not going to be very far from that trail. Mm-hmm. And if you can figure out drainages and ways and routes and ridges that you can stay away from, even a quarter mile away sometimes, guys, half a mile away from those established trails is a really key part of my planning when I'm looking at a higher pressure area. Mm-hmm. So um, keep all that in mind, and that's all covered uh, in the course uh, in that section on that establishing zones of pressure section. And I will say going through the course, the videos are very well detailed. Um, I know we can't play them on, on the feed here, but it's, especially with, with like the Google earth and zones of pressure, it's, it's really awesome. If you have even a second monitor where you can play it, stop it, maybe do, do a couple of application features that you're talking about or specify, make a waypoint change your perspective and then play again and then kind of follow along is, is pretty helpful too. I found. Well, yeah, you said that's we, a great, you we know, that's can coming play up. Them. Yeah. We can yeah. play them. I'm just so not maybe, going to play them. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, you guys, yeah, yeah, maybe exactly. when you go, when you go, go back and edit this, when you go back and edit this, you could put in some of the, you know, some of the videos. Yeah. They're so, really well done. Well, except, except for the talking head that you mentioned earlier, I'm getting rid of that. I'm, Oh, I'm getting rid of that. I can't handle it. Guys. I, I don't know. I've got this aversion to seeing myself on camera. I don't know. There's something about it. Like all my hunting videos that we do, I can't watch them hardly. And all the podcasts I do, I rarely listen to them myself. And I was at a, (laughs) I was at a bear hunting event one time and I was speaking. And after it was over, this whole family comes up to me. Like they got like 97 kids and it's this young wife and young husband. I'm like, man, you guys have been busy. You know, I mean, they got a lot of kids and his wife comes up to me. She goes, I feel like I know you. I'm like, really? She goes, I listen to you every night when I'm laying in bed. I'm like, because <laughs> my husband has had this course. The floating heads. I'm like, I'm like, Oh my. <laughs> That's so, um, anyway. Um, so when you talked about the tools of the trade, when you talked about your um, your dual monitors, guys, one of the things that I do in there, in that module, and that's coming up, or we'll get to that one, it's coming up too, but I want to jump to it since you said something about it was. Yeah, let's skip over right to that one and we'll, and we'll keep rolling through these. Okay, I do recommend a dual monitor setup, guys. It's not very expensive. I would rather see you personally, if money is an object, which you know it is for most people, I'd rather see you buy a cheaper, much cheaper computer. 
and two nicer monitors than a super nice computer and, a, and just use the laptop screen. Because remember, all of your hunt planning, all it's all web-based stuff, mostly, mm -hmm. right? It's all internet-based, browser-based, except for Google Earth Pro. And Google Earth Pro is su such an old application, it runs on anything, right? It All the things we're talking about do not require high-end computer power. So no, I, I would and recommend with technology. Now you can Wi-Fi anything just to a regular TV. You can watch that's it right. through everything. Guys, so. multiple screen. That's the other thing I'll say. Everybody's like, well, I'm going to get a 40 inch. I'm like, that's okay. But I'd rather see you with two 20 inches than 140 inch. For the same reason that he, we just talked about guys, there is a big value into having go hunt Gaia open on one screen google earth open on another screen and going back copying latitude longitude pasting it in and going to the and analyzing it doing the three then going back and dropping a pin and there's a tremendous amount of valuable value in dual monitor setups when it comes to e-scouting so i have a four monitor system now um but i'm going to tell you i'm embarrassed to say this but before i switched to this four monitor setup I had a six monitor set up before that. <laughs> it was like, I was like, my e scouting room was like NASA. It was like, <laughs> I had, I could put up every application that I have, um, but it was too much. It was more for show than it was for reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd get a headache looking at But that. I am switching now to a two mon bigger monitors, two. So I'm constantly tweaking this guy. Now, I'm not recommending you do all this. Um, but I am noticing the best monitor you can get for e-scouting right now is the curved monitors, right? The new curved ones. Mm -hmm. Now, guys, they have come down in price. I would never have recommended that a year ago or even two years ago. They were cost prohibitive. I, I would never spend that much money on a curved monitor. But I this is funny. I was just in Costco and I saw the 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 curved landscape monitors for under two hundred dollars. I was like Holy cow. This is the, the, you know what I'm talking about, right? On these curved mm -hmm. monitors, oh, yeah. you guys have oh, seen yeah. them. They present the almost incredible 3d, um, rev, rev, uh, resolution. So, and just with the ease of your eyes and to absorbing the big picture, um, I really like those monitors. I don't have them yet. So I do not have the curved monitors yet, but I am thinking about it right now. Um, so, Anyway, that was, we we're in the weeds, but I get that question a lot, guys. What do I, okay, if I'm going to do this, how do I do it? Mm -hmm. And that's what I recommend is a spend more money on monitors than you're going to spend on the computer is the basic. Um, okay. So hunt parameters was next. And in that module, I'm going to spend very little time on that because we talked about zones of pressure. So this is mainly for newer hunters, guys. This is for guys, this module is it's really designed for guys that, are, are new, when I say new, under three years, you know, three years of Western hunting. Because one of the biggest mistakes that Western hunters make is they get on Google Earth, they get on their hunt app, they start looking around, they're like, well, I'm going to go here, 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 and here. Well, then when they pull up to Trailhead A, they're like, holy shit, this is way bigger, way steeper, and way further than I thought it was, right? Mm -hmm. We've all been there. We've all driven yeah. up spots and like, oh, man, this is, oh, yeah. this looks a lot more interesting than I thought. <laughs> so, guys, it's real easy to hike around these mountains on Google Earth. But when the truck actually goes into park and you've got to pull that backpack out of the back and you got to make your way to that first camp and that camp is nine miles away, and you're really only capable of doing four miles away. You got a problem, right? You got yeah. a big problem. And we did just to cut you off there. We, uh, this is a, <laughs> that exact thing happened to me and a buddy. We we're going into this area and he, I mean, I'm going to say this the nice way. He's just out of shape. So <laughs> we get there and we start looking at it and he's like, he was intimidated right away. I was like, well, it won't be so bad. We'll just, you know, we'll zigzag up through and we'll make our way up and we'll, we're no rush. We got a third of the way up and he pulled, he pulled the plug. He couldn't do it. So we had to come up with something for the other three days. And, you know, it just, it, we had set our goals and we had 
Yeah. I'd done a lot of ski scouting on that area and I know it holds good mule deer. And it's just, you know, obviously we didn't see a single thing after that because we, you know, we spent a lot of time in areas that we just were that you hadn't planned to be in. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Guys. And so what, that's such a good story, but unfortunately that is so common that, and what happens with that story, Kevin is unfortunately a lot of people that that happens to that ends their Western hunting careers. Yeah. A lot of guys are like, this is, I'm just not cut out for this. And it's not because they're not cut out. It's just because they did not have a plan. Guys, you can kill elk right by the freaking road. You do not have to be 20 miles in to kill an elk. Now, I like to go deep because I like to be no people, unpressured elk. I just like it. I'd rather hunt less elk in a remote backcountry just spot where I'm kind of by myself than I'd rather hunt more elk by the road. And that's just me. That's a personal preference. That's got nothing to do with um, whether there's elk there or not. But a lot well, of it's that's, how you that's put why it, it comes. It, this is the time to get into these courses because you start building a hunt plan, you start doing your e scouting, and if it seems like it's an area where you feel is going to be very physically demanding, now you get in shape. You start yeah. adding that to your hunt that's plan. Right. You, know you know what you're facing. August, yeah, exactly. So what what a hunt parameter is, guys? It's a real simple concept, but it's something that's it's one of those things that's so simple, and it's so often ignored. So in Google Earth and in CalTopo and in a few of the other applications, you can create a radius. So in Google Earth, for example, is where I use it the most. And the reason I do it in Google Earth the most is because where do I do most of my pre-hunt work? In Google Earth. So I'll go to Trailhead A. If I if I know that my limit is about five miles, okay, I, I really don't want to be looking at many areas outside of five miles with my backpack, right? Whatever it is. Well, I draw a five mile radius around that trailhead. And when I'm, and I just leave it on the screen. So when I'm starting to look in and I'm starting to e scout, I'm starting to break it down, guys, that circle gives me a reference to be, re that's my reality zone. Yeah. Right. That doesn't mean I won't creep over the line and look, but how many times are you in Google earth? And you guys are on there a lot, so it's going to be funny. You guys are going to smile when I say this, I bet. All of a sudden, you're looking, and you look back, and you're like, oh, shit, I'm 20 miles on the freaking trailhead here. I, oh, yeah. I'm wasting my time yeah. dropping yeah. weight pins back here, right? And so I have found that that little simple task of dropping that five-mile radius around the trailhead keeps me grounded and keeps me focused on where I need to be focused. Mm -hmm. Because you can waste a lot of time East scouting an area that you actually can't actually hunt. And don't forget, I know this is so stupid. It seems so simple is don't forget that you got to hike in there, but you also got to bring an animal out. Yeah, exactly. So if you're doing elk guys, now most guys, I mean, Kevin, it doesn't matter. He's that dude's a beast. So it doesn't matter. I mean, he, he just brings elk out one strip, but um, <laughs> if you're going to hunt mule deer, <laughs> your radius is probably going to be a little bigger than if you're going to hunt elk solo. Would everybody agree to that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so maybe your blue zone, your hunt parameter is blue for mule deer, and maybe it's red for elk, and you have dip once five miles and once seven miles, whatever. So the I know that sounds like a basic, simple tool, but it is such an effective application. And we talk about why you want to do it, how to do it, and kind of some considerations that you want to think about when you do it in, in that module. Okay. I think you should also have a secondary circle, even though like your five miles, let's say, is your money. Like that's your that's your that's your extent. But Kevin and I have talked about it lots in the last couple of years here in BC, where it's so freaking hot for the first yeah. month and a half of elk season. Okay, that's nice that you can walk that far. Now have a realistic circle as to how far and how long it's going to take you to get that elk, depending on the terrain, when it's oh. 25, 30 degrees Celsius. I don't yeah. care if you can walk another five miles back. Nobody cares if you lose that elk. That's right. Yeah, keep that sure. in mind too. And, and how like, steep like, that terrain is or how nasty it is. Yeah. And like we, we've already talked about in the show is that I lost a lot of my first elk I killed in September 
a lot of the elk went like the bottom part of it went bone sour just because like that day it was 35 degrees celsius and i mean i was trucking pretty fast back to get it out but still i mean you have to work those animals are so hot it's the middle of the rut there's a lot going on so yeah that's setting these well there's a whole there's a whole set of strategies that you can employ for meat care too but you're right so here's the other thing too you know like kevin mentioned this before his buddy was kind of over his um over his head on this hunt right on the mule deer hunt right it was a little beyond his capability so they had to make an adjustment do you remember when i said earlier that i like to have five hunt plans right and remember how i said one of them is should be at least one of them should be a radical change in elevation right well one of them also should be a base camp hunt meaning from a vehicle from a base camp because what if you get hurt what if you twist your ankle what if you get fatigued what if you get altitude sickness all kinds of things where you need to you need to fall back to a little bit different than a backcountry back back in hunt well why not have a pre-designed spot that you can hike from the road every day and hunt that way you're ready to like if you had that case and you're you're ready to implement it you're ready to jump to it if you need to now you know most cases you're you're going to be fine on your back five miles in but if it gets hot you get injured you get whatever situation causes you to resort to a base camp hunt so when i set up my strategy of my hunt plan I've got, like I said, five options. One of them is always a radical change in elevation for a lot of reasons. That we don't need to get into it right now. Not just snow. And the second one is I always have an option for a base camp hunt. Even though I'm a llama guy, I pack in, guys. I love to pack in, right? I love to go deep. But I always have a vehicle base camp option somewhere in my strategy. And um, that's right.